No separation exists between us and books. Simulating Oneness. This program analyzes, reviews, and breaks down books across all genres through a conscious lens. Synergizing literary theory, philosophy, psychology, spirituality, and the occult, Conscious Book Reviews co-creates a new literary consciousness transcending objective interpretations. What's up to all my writing outlaws out there? This is Ian Katanak from ConsciousWritersTribe.com here today to bring you another conscious book review and analysis of Tom Robbins' beautiful novel, Still Life with Woodpecker. And you know a book is going to be dope. And all Tom Robbins' books are fucking dope. Dope, FYI. But when you go to Goodreads or Amazon, and there are 90% of the reviews are five stars. But then the other 10% of reviews are one star shit talking reviews with those people just writing paragraph after paragraph about, about the book. And if you want to step into the role of being a polarizing author, of being a conscious writer, of being a groundbreaking individual in whatever field you're in, there is going to be hate. The fundamentalists in that field are going to be ready to tear you down. And that's what happens to a lot of Tom Robbins books. People don't have the humor. People don't have the knowledge. And I would say that if you are super religious or super close-minded or old, you are not going to like a Tom Robbins book. It's just not going to happen. And if I don't expect as a conscious spiritual writer that if I write an objectively good narrative, people who believe in a he God in the sky who has a resurrected son are really gonna enjoy you know, what I'm writing about, about drugs and, and about resurrections through drugs. And, <laughs> and uh, so that's the first thing I just want to say. I just want to address that, that Tom Robbins is a dope author. And if you have, haven't read this book yet or are here to see, read this book and read everything Tom Robbins has, Robbins has written. So now we're going into spoiler territory, everybody. And at the core, this book is so good because Tom Robbins uses oppositions so well, but it's a weird form of opposition that there's these you know, very big oppositions, but they have a lot of idiosyncrasies within them, but then at the core, the opposition, the polarities are synergized. For instance, uh, Leigh Cherie, if I'm saying her name right, is a princess, but she's kind of a, or I guess she's a former princess, and she's kind of a snoot. She goes to school. She goes to college. She's a cheerleader, likes, you know, it's going to a, a humanitarian and environmentalist and a redhead. Bernard is an outlaw, a scumbag, uh, an anarchist, and he's also a redhead. And apparently he doesn't care. And so they have this general synergy of being redheads, but then they have these big weird idiosyncrasies, oppositions. But at the core, those people are about the same people. You know, if you were living in the suburbs of Seattle and having to go through the monotony of life, you are just a, a, an anarchist who hasn't, you know, got the courage or found someone to turn you into an anarchist yet. And that's what we see exactly happen. And this novel is a is a play on, and there's a photo of Tom Robbins, ladies and gentlemen. Look at that. Look at that, man. That's, that's, a, that's a polarizer right there. And, <laughs> and one of the things that Tom Robbins also does is the metafiction. Like as soon as we start reading the first couple pages, we're talking about his typewriter and moving us into that because metafiction is weird. And Slavo Zizek, Zizek the philosopher, critical theorist, would say that it's a cheap tactic because the reason is by making us mirror back and look at ourselves, we you know understand that it's all just a fiction, that it's all just a game. But he would say that that's the whole point of fiction is to get lost in the illusion, to not know that it's a game. And by telling us that it's a game, then we it loses its appeal. But Tom Robbins does it in a more humorous way. I'm sure you guys have seen some metafiction before that you know, or in movies especially where it's kind of cheesy and it really does ruin it. I mean. 
you know, but I, I really, that doesn't happen very often. Like Monty Python and the Holy Grail or the Holy Mountain, uh, some David Lynch films. Like you, when you realize what's going on, Inland Empire or DOA TV show, when you realize that it's just a big metafiction going on, it blows your mind as long as it doesn't happen too early. But uh, Tom Robbins does it in the first, does it in the prologue and he's doing it all, all throughout the whole novel. And I think that's very bold of him because to be able to pull that off as an author, it takes skill. And that's something I think that we should address about Tom Robbins. Most people fail at that and he does a good job at pulling that off, the metafiction. And that's what we see in this photo over here that th the hands are writing each other, that there's this Ouroboros type action going on. That's a really dope picture. So the other weird thing that he introduces in the metafiction st stages is the moon phase stuff. And Bernard makes it connect to fertility. I can teach you about how to be fertile. That's something called natural fertility method. If you guys want to look that up, it's like the natural form of birth control. And, um, but suddenly there's this connection. There's this polarity because who's the moon and who is the sun? There's when there, there is a moon, there is a sun. The, sun. the moon is illuminated by the sun. And introducing that spiritual element is a conscious thing to do. It is true. We are affected by the moon. You know, I don't know if you're into astrology or not, but even if you're not, you know, the moon affects tides and our bodies are made of water and we don't need to get into all that right now. But I think that the moon part adds romance, a, a bit of romance. It's like a roman romantic foundation to the novel, which we'll see in a second, because this novel Still Life with Woodpecker is a, an ultimate troll on the Disney princess archetype, on the Disney princess, you know, storyline we were, most of us were raised with. If your parents didn't raise you with that, bless them if they were, you know, good parents, you know. But if you didn't have to experience the princess and Prince Charming programming of Disney, then, you know, good on you. But Tom Robbins takes this and throws it out of whack. She, Lay Cherie's a freaking princess and her dad, Max, and her mom, Tilly, are, you know, the queen and king that are now gone. And they all have problems. Unlike, you know, most princess stories, right from the start, we see problems. Le Cherie has an, a miscarriage on the fucking field. Like, he builds these people up. Once again, we get this opposition between the princess and normal person, or a princess and the fallen princess, and the princess just keeps falling. Abortion. You know, humanitarian now, future anarchist, future celebrity, you know, um, future suicidal maniac at the end of the novel. And her play, his, excuse me, Tom Robbins play on the, the princess archetype is smart because he knows it's going to work. We eat that shit up. If you've ever enjoyed a Disney movie, you've ate it up. And that's within your subconscious. That's within your soul. And we like to see parody. We like to see weird things going on like nothing i'm a fan of mma and back in the day the japanese organizations would put like a 150 pound guy versus a 350 pound guy just for the parody just to see what would happen just because it was different and i feel like that's what tom robbins is doing here he's adding in bernard as the weirdest prince charming ever with these shitty teeth and with you know bad ha a bad habit of being a, a you know a pyromaniac and i think that's I think that's smart of him. And here's some fan art that I, uh, I pulled up. This one's by, I think, Ducks X Sa 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 X Moo. I mean, this is all pretty crappy, but this is their depictions of Leishery. I mean, not to bag on anybody, but, you know, they're pretty good. There's Leishery right here with her frog. That one's a little bit better. This one's pretty good. We have Leishery right here. This is like the hot, hot girl Leishery. Then here's the only one of Bernard. There's only one of Bernard, and here he is. Uh, it's like an, it's like a weird animation style. And uh, to quote from the book, Tom Robbins says that love is the ultimate law, outlaw. It won't just. I think this is Bernard speaking. It won't just adhere to any rules. The most any of us can do is sign on as its accomplice. Instead of vowing to honor and obey, maybe we should swear to aid and abet. 
That would mean that the security that security is out of the questions. The word make and stay become inappropriate. My love for you has no strings attached. I love you for free. And that blows up every single archetype we've heard in the Disney film. Every single thing. This is going back to like Osho and Eastern senses of relationships. This breaks the Christian model of monogamy and attachment and we need to get married. And I, it sounds like they're gonna be monogamous, but at the same time, I mean, I guess they're not at the, almost at the end of the novel, but attachment and staying in labels hurt relationships. They've hurt that so many relationships. So many things have gone out of whack because someone demands a label, demands staying and leaving and all these different things instead of just flowing and accepting who you are and wanting to be around each other because you want to be around each other. And that's this is like a guide to love almost. This is... Um, I gave this book to my girlfriend right at the start um, of our relationship. And I was like, yo, read this. And she was like, you know, and it just changes your perspective on relationships, which is weird when you look at a novel like this that's so silly, but it should, like this is how relationships should be functioning. Like we should have that type of devotion Lachery has and the wildness that Bernard has and the blending of those two together. And these two underappreciated protagonists, I guess Leishery is the main protagonist, but a secondary, the secondary or, you know, character of Bernard is they're just both underappreciated. That Bernard is trying to make a statement by blowing things up. I mean, honestly, it sounds like he's doing it for a reason. We've never seen someone do that in real life. We've never seen a terrorist with a cause necessarily. They, they always have these weird manifestos. <laughs> And I, I'm, you know, not recommending that for anybody, but it's weird in the sense that we can fantasize about that. Like, who would do this? Like, what is this? And in the 80s, that was a lot more realistic without, like, the, you know, the police state that we have now in the world. And with another part, which we'll talk about in a bit, is that this is a libertarian novel. This is an anarchist novel. This is a novel that functions with something we like to call twofold consciousness. The consciousness of man and nature, that man and something larger than itself, inherent rights in nature. And that's what the pack, you know, the cigarette pack is. It's, the, it's a choice. And we'll get to some of that more later. So let's go to Hawaii. So they're on Hawaii for CareFest. And I don't know if you guys ever been to Hawaii. I would recommend it. Great place, man. Kind of a sad place because, you know, we, the United States colonized Hawaii and it's like run down. There's a shit ton of homeless people now. And uh, this, this is a side note. It just, it just blew my mind when I saw like native Hawaiian people being homeless and living in shacks. I was like, whoa, like this was like they lived here anyway. So Bernard's coming to blow up the conference with Ralph Nader speaking and, and like uh, Ralph Nader's funny because I'm 27 and. I barely know who Ralph Nader is. And I know him as just as like the liberal little guy. I didn't know he was like super into environmentalism and stuff. That was more like Al Gore for me back in the early 2000s. So Ralph Nader being into that is funny. <laughs> so I thought that was super funny. I think that was just more of him being in the times when he wrote this. But to quote um, another romantic quote, now that we're just talking about love, romance is not a bandwagon to be jumped on by lost souls with nothing more interesting to ride. Society is all too eager to turn the deepest, most authentic human experiences into another shallow fad. Leave it to, naive world, uh, to a, a, a naive world saver like you to view our love as a sacred cause when in fact all of it was some barking at, all it was was some barking at the moon. And that, that's a line of tension from Bernard in the sense that he, you know, when Le Cherie takes up the cause for him, you know, after he gets arrested on Hawaii, um, but really love isn't the sacred cause. It's really, it's an emotion. And this is coming back to contact, to presence, to Whitman's contact. And um, I'm losing the name. I think Charles Olson's, oh man, I'm losing it. Oh shit. Uh, anyway, you know, the poetics of the early 20th century, the nature and find Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot. Um, I'm so, I'm going to pause this and we're going to find out that book name. Boom, it's called Projective Verse, everybody. If you're a poet, go read Projective Verse. It's only a couple pages and it changed writing and it talks about contact with nature and the breath. It's drawing from the east and writing from the flow. Super, 
super dope stuff, everybody. But anyway, that's what he's talking about here is love in the moment. Once again, we're kind of getting these Eastern, these Eastern tendencies coming into Robbins. And if you've ever read Jigger, J- Jitterbug Perfume, that you could tell that he's into. If you've ever seen Tom Robbins' bookshelf, and as we're about to look at at in a second, uh, his favorite books that he recommends to people, then you'll see. So let's let's hop into that real fast. Just as a little interview loop, just an anarchy. There it is, everybody. Anarchy, and this really is an anarchist novel. These they are anarchists. They are blowing stuff up for a cause. They are living free. They don't, you know, as with the camel pack and all this. It's about a choice. It's about moving into self-sustainability and individuality and i know you know the writing community is very uh not into anarchism and libertarianism but tom robbins is tom robbins is a pretty pretty big libertarian so let's talk about some of tom robbins recommended books so tom robbins recommends reading marshall McLuhan, and i would 100 percent recommend marshall McLuhan to anybody uh media is the massage or the message Uh, That's a great book. Another cool thing about Marshall McLuhan is that he wrote his thesis statement, I think, at the University of Toronto on the Trivium Method. And the Trivium Method is a Catholic uh, system of critical thinking, which goes grammar, logic, rhetoric. Then there's the Quadrivium with algebra, geometry, astronomy, and something else I can't name off the top of my head. And it's a way, because if I asked you right now, what's your system of critical thinking? How do you, if I give you some information right now, how are you going to process it? Most people process it just in their brain. They have their own unique way. But much like any other system, much like any other field, systems of critical thinking that have been developed. And the trivium is a very powerful one because you can do it without attachment to any ideology. And it's very thorough. But McLuhan was really into that, which I blew my mind when I realized that because I had read a ton of McLuhan. And just if you want to get a basic idea about marketing and the media and about the mass control system that we that you know that has manifested he is the guy to go to and i think the reason McLuhan was so and the reason i talked about the trivium i think he was so groundbreaking because he had that law he had that grammar logic and rhetoric He, he knew that system he could analyze what was going on objectively before things got too crazy because right after McLuhan, we hit a state of hyper reality as Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard would say, because now there's too much information to consume. We don't know what's going on. Things have hit a level where, you know, the multiples of information that entered the world on social media and online every day are exponential. We can't even track it anymore. But back then they had a tighter grip on it. So McLuhan, then he is... Tom Robbins was friends with Terrence McKenna, which I think is cool. Terrence McKenna was a psychedelic advocate, pioneer, helped bring uh, home-growing mushrooms to the United States, helped bring psychedelics really into second-wave psychedelicism, I would say. Tim Leary and Ram Dass, Richard Alpert being the first, and then, and Tom Robbins did LSD with Tim Leary, apparently, but Terrence McKenna was like the second wave, and I would say we're like in third-wave psychedelic, psychedelics right now, but... Uh, Tom Robbins recommends his book, Archaic Revival. And what's really cool about Archaic Revival, and we're just, this stuff's important. This is Conscious Book, Conscious conscious Writers Tribe, or Conscious Book Club. Uh, The Archaic Survival, the first, or Revival, excuse me, the first chapter talks about the difference between simple and complex schizophrenics and how it connects to psychedelics. Basically, they argue that if you take psychedelics, a big dose, you turn it into a schizophrenic, a complex one, because what you've seen what you felt and saw has no tangible effect or it has you can't use it to has no relation to this world is what i'm trying to say but to become a sch- simple schizophrenic you you start to integrate what you've learned back into this world cuz you might have seen aliens and felt vibrations and astral projected but what does that all mean and that's why psychedelics can drive people crazy because they don't know how to reintegrate. So there was a lot of cool stuff in that book, and I thoroughly enjoy Terrence McKenna. His brother, Dennis McKenna, uh, I have met before. I've actually had a couple conversations with him at a conference. I was at a at a conference, and it was I don't know why he was there. It wasn't a botany or psychedelic conference. It was more of like an occult conference, and he, no one really knew who he was. So I would be out there talking to him while he was trying to sell, while he was at his book, like selling, trying to sell books, and. It was, it was pretty crazy. 
So Dennis McKenna um, also wrote this book, The Archaic Revival with Terrence McKenna. And I would recommend his work too. He's been on Joe Rogan a couple times and other good podcasts, Dennis McKenna. Um, super cool guys, man. You know, there's, there's some hate on the McKenna brothers out there. Some people say they were in the CIA and all this stuff. But, you know, you got to analyze people for who they are and what information they're giving out. Is something subversive is a kid in Ohio who's, you know, likes, who's a fucking redneck. Is, is it good that he has mushrooms, which turn him into more of what he already is? Probably not. But <laughs> you can't stop the flow of the flow of progression. Then we have the Tao of Physics by Friedrich Capra, and this is a good book if you're just trying to get into, um, if you like Eastern mysticism, yoga, Buddhism, and you like physics and quantum physics. This is a great book. Love this book. Recommend it to everybody. We'll hit it at some point. Then we have a Alan Watts book, the book on the taboo against knowing who you are. Anything by Alan Watts is pretty good. Alan Watts is another kind of polarizing figure because he was an alcoholic and a druggie. Same with like a lot of those people, Robert Anton Wilson and Wilson and Ram Dass. I guess Richard Alpert, Ram Dass cleaned up his act. They were troubled figures, but you know we can't once again hold them really into account for that. And I would recommend the book on the taboo against knowing who you are. That one's that one's that one's I would say on my a lot lower on my list of recommended books, not even in the top 100 or even 200, but it's a solid read. Any, anything by Alan, reading, knowing and reading an Alan Watts book, I think is, should be mandatory. Then we have Joseph Campbell. I'm sure you guys have heard of the mythologist Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth. I mean, there's a lot of great books by Joseph Campbell. If you want to understand archetypes and what's happening, even in Tom Robbins literature, Joseph Campbell is integral because apparently they knew each other. And Tom Robbins actually draws from a lot of these people. Tom Robbins was a, a part of this weird little, he was between two worlds from what I've done in my research. He was between like the psychedelic world and the hippie world of like Robert Anton Wilson and Tim Leary and um, that crowd, like the Hunter S. Thompson crowd. But then he was a part of like the male the male movement and the reintegration of consciousness with like people like Joseph Campbell and Michael Mead and Robert Bly, as we'll see in a second. Uh, he was a part of that somehow too. And he has knows all those guys. And I think those are two very powerful movements. And I think that's why his literature is so good. People don't realize is that people don't realize that reading is very important for literature. Like maybe not getting started, but if you want to write something like this with all these references and be fucking Slick with it, you gotta know your shit. Then he recommends, yeah, Robert Bly and News of the Universe, Poems of Twofold Consciousness. And I would recommend everyone go read that book, News of the Universe. That is on my top five list also. Everyone should read this book. It talks about how poet, the transformation of poetry. It talks about how Christianity got rid of nature and poetry, how it destroyed the concept of nature and um, just nature in general and the love of animals out of poetry. And he shows that. And then he shows the the transformation of nature. Do you know with the old people like Goethe and William Wordsworth and then to Walt Whitman and the Pounds and the Elliots and the Snyders and the Robin Jeffers and then to the, you know more modern poetry. He shows a whole transformation of uh, eco-poetry. And by the time you're seeing this, you'll probably... Uh, I'll probably have my book out, my poetry book, Silence in the Shamanic Desert. That's a, it's an eco-poetry book based in the desert and has a lot of psychedelic feel to it. So go check that out if you guys want. That's coming out in January of 2021. So next month, I think you guys will like, if you guys like Tom Robbins, it's up to Sam Alley, but it's poetry, eco-poetry. So let's hop right into the camel pack though. And if you guys see on the right side, of this pack, it says choice quality, and as Lay Cherie's in the room, so now that we're let's let's get hop back on the plot line. So Bernard's arrested, and they have sex, and he gets arrested, and it's tragic to Lay Cherie. And you know, people were commenting, and my God, man, the di like every review I read that was on a personal website, not all of them, but there was one like rereading Still Life with Woodpecker, and it was. A, a proclaimed feminist saying, I can't believe I enjoyed this 20 years ago. As a feminist now, I can't believe he called a, a vagina, what do you call it, like a pe peace clam or, or something, man. Um, I, I don't know who these people are and these lofty people, but, you know, when you hang out with your friends, you know, you throw out, 
you say things. Like, people are fun. Like, we can't stop them. I don't – fuck political correctness. Like, we don't need to be mean to people. Shouldn't be racially slurring people. We shouldn't be degrading women. But being degrading in general is funny. It – so, anyway <laughs> – so a lot of these authors, though, and a lot of and some bad reviews on Goodreads and Amazon were like, "Oh, just it's such a typical portrayal of a female." Ugh. Are you kidding me? Have you ever done that? All these women out there, have you ever d- done something as dynamic as what locking yourself in the basement for a cause that you care about and for a love? This isn't the Disney princess locking herself in the castle. This is some weird shit. This is her like becoming weird and being like a weirdo. This is bizarre. You're like, like they're analyzing it from 50,000 feet instead of, instead of seeing that this is a dope ass thing. This is breaking the art types. This is like the modern woman. This is like some, you know, really psychoanalytical stuff going on, but they just want to reduce it because they want, you know, they want this certain narrative and they will push a diversity quota on you and on your book publishing company and on whatever you want to do to make sure that they get that. If you don't have enough diversity, you know, if this was written in 2020, it wouldn't get published. There's, you know, I think both characters are white. Everyone's white. Um, they put, push, you know, peace clam or whatever. Not the Lacherie's not strong enough. She needs Bernard. Oh, Bernard, come saving that. What this wouldn't get published, everybody. If, if I this never got released and I sent this in, gone. Not published. <laughs> anyway, I'm raging. So let's talk about. The camel pack. And this is the exact line when the camel pack is happening. It, quote, they, they would try sending a word from their dimension into ours. How carefully that word was chosen. The word that allows yes. The word that makes no possible. The word that puts the free in freedom and takes the obligation out of love. The word that throws a window open after the final door is closed. The word which all adventure, all exhilaration, all meaning, all honor depends. The word that fires evolution's motor of mud. The word that the cocoon whispers to the caterpillar. The word that molecules recite before bonding. The word that separates that which is dead from that which is living. The word no mirror can turn around. In the beginning was the word and the word was choice. That's so deep. That This is like how you write a libertarian novel. If you are going to write a libertarian or anarchist novel, this that is a prime example of how you deliver a message after, I mean, God knows how many pages was that did we get that message delivered, you know, probably after around 200 pages and make a point. And it was crazy that some of these, um, you know, some of these authors talking shit were like, uh, they, they were excited about him giving choice because I think they wanted – it triggered something about them and consent in their brain and about women's choice and all this stuff. But then he's not talking about that. He's talking about individual's choice, which is limited by government, which is limited by control. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, the agenda that they're trying – that you're trying to push – I'm speaking to the authors that read those review. This is not that type of choice. This is an individual's choice. This is free will. This is going your own way as long as it's nonviolent and nonviolent toward others. As long as you're not thieving or hurting others, the animal animals or the earth. That's what this is talking about, man. This is the choice. This is the most mind-blowing concept maybe ever put in literature right here, everybody, on the camel pack. And that's why Leishery had to discover it. And people are still giving this one fucking stars. Can you believe this shit? It's why? Because they haven't taken a, to- taken a choice in their life. I'm about to record a video on um, my Writing Motivation Wednesdays video. Go check that out too. And I'm going to be talking about the choice. The choice you have to make. There is choices you need to make. And if you want to change the world, it starts with a choice, man. And the world, the word that fires evolution's motor of mud, man. The word that allows yes, the word that makes no possible. And boom, baby, like I said, this is fire, man. And when she realizes it awakens her consciousness, this delivery, this message. And it's crazy because it's on the cigarette pack. Like it's your choice to smoke this choice quality. And it's like you're choosing this path. You are choosing your life right now. Everything you see around you is a manifestation of what you have already done. You can change everything around you if you put enough energy into it. So the camel pack, everybody, and there is the pyramid. So now we're moving on to the pyramids. I know this is pretty loose, 
But I mean, this is a Tom Robbins book review, everybody. What, do you, what, the, what the fuck do you expect? If you're, if you are still listening to this right now, send me a message, leave a comment, say what's up. Like you are on the team. Like you get what's going on. I just want to say I love you and thank you for being here. And as we're concluding this show, so the pyramid. So, uh, Le Cherie is gets with F- Fizel, I think his name is after her pan, after the royalty is reensued and. Uh, she's being married off to Fazel, who she says, build me a pyramid. And he builds her a pyramid. That's pretty cool. And it was heartbreaking. I'm sure you felt heartbroken during this when you're like, what? Why is she doing this? And I was like, please don't get laid. Just don't have sex. I was like, are they going to have sex? Because that's so sad. Like, I know that's like a weird monogamous programming I have, but I'm like, oh, man, like, don't do them dirty like that, man. Don't do them dirty. But another quote to talk about the romance, though, because we're still, this is all a romantic novel. This is literally just a romance, a romance novel. This is a fairy tale. I guess I haven't said that yet. This, this is a fairy tale. And quote, a romantic, however, recognizes that the movement, the organization, the institution, the revolution, if it comes to that, is merely a backdrop for his or her own personal drama. And that to pretend otherwise is to surrender freedom and the will to, to-, to the totalitarian impulse. It is is to replace psychological reality with sociological illusion. And it really is a backdrop. Everything else is a backdrop because when love starts to have boundaries, when love starts to have all this baggage from society, you lose the choice. It starts to influence you. Love is a choice. Love is the ultimate choice. And that's what's so beautiful about this novel and about a lot of Tom Robbins' work is that we learn about true love. Love is, is something that you create. And true love is, and you know, once again, check out my uh, other video on the psychology of romantic love by Robert A. Johnson, but you have to create true love. It doesn't matter how dynamic or how compatible you are with someone you're not going to be in all areas. It should be bad because you have to make it right. You have to make the choice to make it right every single day. Like there are better, sometimes you might be looking out and there might be better people out there. But as long as your partner isn't a fucking narcissist psychopath and they're trying to tear you down and like ruin your creativity, they're not doing that, man. I really don't see the the reason for, you know, not trying to make it work. And that's what this novel is showing about like true love and not lust love and not, you know, what we've been programmed to do. So we're just, I'm gonna run through a couple more quotes to conclude here. Um, Quote, how can one person be more real than any other? Well, some people do hide and others seek. Maybe those who are hiding, escaping encounters, avoiding surprises, protecting their poverty, ignoring their fantasies, restricting their feelings, sitting out the pan pipe, hootie cooch of experience. Maybe those people, People who won't talk to rednecks, or if they're they're rednecks, won't talk to intellectuals. People who are afraid to get their shoes muddy or their noses wet. Afraid to eat what they can crave. Afraid to drink Mexican water. Afraid to bet for a long shot to win. Afraid to hitchhike, jaywalk, conky-tonk, kage, osculate, levitate, rocket, bop it, suck it, or bark at the moon. Maybe such people are simply inauthentic. And maybe the jack leg humanist who says differently is due to have his tongue fried on the hot slabs of, of liar's hell. Some folks hide and some folks seek. And seeking when it's mindless, neurotic, desperate, or salamious can be a form of hiding. But there are folks who want to know and who aren't afraid to look and won't turn tail should they find it. And if they never do, they'll have a good time anyway because nothing, neither the terrible truth nor the absence of it is going to cheat them out of one honest breath of verse sweet gas. And that is a life statement right there, everybody. That is a statement that is so deep. Like, I can't tell you all the snoots out there who won't talk to a Trump voter or all the snoots out there who won't talk to Biden people. And they don't realize that they're stuck in a dialectical, complete political game and that politics are a fucking joke. And the amount of infighting and energy being put toward that is crazy. And like, like he says, the people who won't talk to a redneck, I know people like that. And I know rednecks who will uh, talk, who won't talk to intellectuals. When I was in first night, I moved to Oregon. I moved out to backwoods, Oregon to be a ski instructor. I go to this party and I'm talking to this fucking redneck, bro. Like he's, I've never seen such a redneck and I'm talking to him and he's like, 
within 30 seconds of talking, he says, I want to beat your ass right now. And all I've done is like, Hey, how you doing, man? Like, what's up, man? He's like, I, you, he's like, you look, you talk like you're from the East coast. And I'm like, what? I'm from the West coast. dog. And he started getting fucking pissy with me. And he's like, you talk too smart. I'm like, I wasn't even talking smart. Like I literally wasn't even, I was like 18. I, I was like a dumbass. And, but I was the smartest guy this guy had ever encountered. And he was ready to take me out. And <laughs> crazy story, man. That guy actually committed suicide. And then when I was leaving, or last day I'm leaving Oregon, I'm leaving Oregon, right? I'm like driving, my car's fucking packed. And I see that guy hitchhiking. And I pick him up and I'm like, where are you going? He's like, I need a ride to work, man. I'm so fucking late. And I'm like, all right, I'll give you a ride to work. And I give him a ride to work and it's misty up there. It's, it's in Oregon. So at the ski resort, which is like up on Mount Hood, it's all misty. And I shake hands and I'm like, and he's like, you're, you're not so bad, man. I'm like, yeah, man. <laughs> weird, weird synchronicity, like literally pulling out and, you know, driving a mile down the highway and there's him just standing there. I don't even know how he got there. He could have been a phantom, you know, rest in peace. Uh, you know, anyway. You got to push your limits, everybody. You got to get out of your comfort zone. And I'd like to end with fun quote where you know, it's like on Pat, uh, page like eight or nine. And he's talking about Albert Camus. And if any of you guys have ever read the myth of Scythius, which I'll get into at a later time, the myth of uh, Scythius is about, you know, Scythius who has to carry, keep carrying the boulder up the hill and it falls down. And that's his lifelong punishment. It's a Greek and Roman uh, myth. And, uh, the first line of it, it's like, there's only one vital question man needs to ask is life. Like, does he need to kill himself or not? I botched that, but I think that's right. And so <laughs> Robbins writes, Albert Camus wrote, the only serious question is whether to kill yourself or not. Tom Robbins wrote that the only serious question is whether time has a beginning or an end. Camus, Camus clearly got up on the wrong side of the bed and Robbins must have, have, have forgot to set the alarm. There's only one serious question, and that is, who knows how to make love stay? And once again, that's the serious, he tells us right at the start, that's what we're doing. This is a love novel. This is a fairy tale. The characters are strong in this. He builds the characters. He makes us relate to them. He gives them backstory. There is a somewhat strong plot, but the plot is that they, Bernard and Lacherie want to get together. People were talking shit on the plot. Once again, I don't know where they got that from. I don't think they're so used to this pitter-patter commercialized plot that they don't understand that this is a very deep plot. So we're going to end that there. I'm kind of going on and uh, subscribe to the channel. Say what's up. I will catch you guys later. All my writing outlaws out there, you guys can live the life of your dreams. You can live the same fairy tale. I'll catch you guys later. Peace.